God, may your spirit and guidance be in us as we work for the benefit of all our people, for peace and justice in our land, and for the constant recognition of the dignity and aspirations of those whom we serve. Amen. Minister statements. Minister statements. Minister responsible for housing NWT. Mr. Speaker, the government of the Northwest Territories remains dedicated to strengthening its leadership and authority on climate change, as well as ensuring that climate change impacts are specifically considered when making government decisions. As part of this commitment, Housing NWT continues to improve the energy efficiency of its housing stock and continues to make strategic investments in alternative energy solutions that not only help lower social housing operation costs and improve living conditions, but also reduces greenhouse gas emissions. To help chart this critical path forward, Housing NWT is advancing the development of an energy management strategy and a three-year energy blueprint. These two documents will support both Housing NWT's energy goals and objectives, as well as the strategic objective of GNWT's 2030 energy strategy. Housing NWT's energy management stra strategy will propose short to medium term strategies to 2030, as it takes a long term view towards 2050 to guide energy management decisions and investments. The strategy is supported by the three-year energy management blueprint that will include measurable ac actions to track progress and outcomes over the course of the next several years. Mr. Speaker, investments in energy efficiency solutions are not new to Housing NWT. Each year, Housing NWT's capital plan includes significant investments in moder modernization and improvement projects that include various energy efficiency upgrades, as well as new construction with high efficiency, standards that exceed the National Energy Code by at least 20%. In recent years, Housing NWT has delivered 13 solar and biomass alternative energy projects for public housing units. Throughout the Northwest Territories, with the federal government's support, we also plan on investing in additional biomass district heating systems for public housing senior facilities in Fort Simpson and in Fort Providence. Recognizing the importance of public engagement in the development of energy management strategy, in December 2022, Housing NWT will be releasing a draft strategy and blueprint for public review and comments. The feedback collected during this engagement process will guide and finalize the strategy and accompanying blueprint, ensuring successes in creating a realistic and effective approach to the energy management of housing and WTS units, while contributing to healthy communities and smaller utility bills for residents. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to the release of the energy management strategy and energy blueprint. Except, um, expected for April 2023. Housing NWT will continue to work closely with Indigenous governments, Indigenous organizations, community governments, the private sector, nonprofit sector, and our federal funding partners as, well, as we address the territory's housing crisis. We will ensure climate change impacts are considered in the development of public housing units, helping the territorial transition in lower car carbon economy. I would also like to thank the staff of Housing NWT for contributing and putting this document together. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister Statements. Minister Statements. Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the Government of the Northwest Territories has made it a key priority to advance the development of the all-season Mackenzie Valley Highway. Mr. Speaker, infrastructure development plays an essential role in the longevity and the health of our communities. A key component to the Department of Infrastructure's transportation strategy, the proposed 321-kilometer 
Mackenzie Valley Highway between the communities of Norman Wells and Wrigley will connect several remote communities to the public highway system year-round. Make these connections more resilient to the effects of climate change and create future economic opportunities. Infrastructure projects like the Mackenzie Valley Highway plays a significant part in the economic future of the Northwest Territories. Not only as we recover from the effects of COVID-19 pandemic, but as we advance transformative nation-building projects like this to the benefit of Northern, Northerners and Canadians alike. This project will inject millions into the economy, create jobs for residents, build capacity in the communities and within Indigenous governments, and open the door to future economic development that will positively impact the Northwest Territories. We have, made pro we have made progress on this project, Mr. Speaker, and I want to provide an update to the members of this House on the status of the project cur is currently. In July 2018, $140 million in funding was secured under Transport Canada's National Trade Corridors Fund for the environmental assessment and planning studies for this portion of the Mackenzie Valley Highway project, as well as the planning, engineering, and construction of the Great Bear River Bridge and Mount Gadet Access Road. Mr. Speaker, over the last year, work has progressed on addressing information gaps and preparing the developer's assessment report, which is required to advance the environmental assessment. Engagement with Indigenous governments and Indigenous organizations in the region is progressing, and capacity funding has been provided to the Satu Secretariat Incorporated Hadzike First Nation to lead a Renewable Resource Council and the Norman Wells Renewable Resource Council so they can participate fully in the engagement for this project and partner in the completion of the tradi traditional knowledge studies. Public engagement on the proposed project description was carried out in the spring of 2022. An in-person socio socioeconomic impact assessments related interviews are currently underway. In the coming months, additional in-person engagement in the Satu and the Detro re regions will complete the project description and discuss potential project impacts and mitigation measures. The information collected through this engagement will be used to finalize the developer's assessment report for submission to the Mackenzie Valley Environmental Review Board, which is early 2023. The GWT is also working to advance some short road extensions along the Mackenzie Valley Highway alignment intended as capacity building projects. These projects are advancing separately from the Mackenzie Valley Highway environmental assessment. The Mount Gadet Access Road is a proposed 15-kilometer all-season road from Hodgkins Creek to Mount Gadet, near Wrigley. The regulatory process for this project was paused in 2020 to provide the GWT with opportunities to address concerns raised by Pedzike First Nation. This past August, the Mackenzie Land Water Board withdrew its project's application. Follow-up discussions with the board resulted in the application being reactivated. We have committed to taking collaborative approach with PEDZK First Nation and the Land and Water Board to, to plan for the review of these applications to restart. The Prohibition Creek Access Road is another capacity building project that's located near Norman Wells. As I explained in my minister statement last week, the procurement for phase one construction is underway with construction expected to begin this fall. The Department of Infrastructure has and will continue to work closely with Indigenous governments and Indigenous organizations as we advance this important project. Queen Aini, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Minister Statements. Minister Statements. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Thabatcha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I want to talk once again about the Aurora College Thabatcha campus and future Polytechnic University headquarters. Mr. Speaker, I want to again reiterate to this House about the role Fort Smith has, has historically had within education for the people of the NWT. 
1967, when the NWT changed its capital to Yellowknife, it was agreed upon by the leaders of the day that in exchange for the loss of the capital, Fort Smith would become the education capital of the NWT. Ever since then, the head campus of the Aurora College has been in Fort Smith, and many prominent elected leaders for, from across the NWT have gone to school in Fort Smith. Mr. Speaker, I do not agree with certain directions that Aurora College has been taking regarding its transformation into a polytechnic university. I particularly repute the notion that there will not be a headquarters with the new university. I strongly disagree with the college president dismissing the terms headquarters and instead, instead favoring the phrase administrative center. I do not want to see Fort Smith diminished in the role it will play within the future university because I know that Fort Smith will continue to play a vital role within the future of the post-secondary education in the Northwest Territories, just as it always has, and I will make sure of that. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education has re reiterated several times throughout this term that the headquarters of the future Polytechnic University will be in Fort Smith. On December the 10th, 2019, on our first day of session after choosing the cabinet, the minister said that there will be no plans to move the headquarters out of Fort Smith. Then later, in October 2020, the minister said he was not aware of any discussion to move the headquarters anywhere else. Then in March of this year, the minister, minister said ECE was not going to build a new headquarters because there was already a location for it in Fort Smith. Finally, in June, during our last sitting, the minister said there's no plan to move the administrative headquarters from Fort Smith to Yellowknife. Mr. Speaker, as the MLA for Tabacha, it is my duty to look after the people and the interests of Fort Smith and the broader South Slave region. Therefore, I will do whatever I can to ensure my community will thrive and prosper in the future. And I know that the university will be part of that future, even after I'm gone. That's, that is why I will continue to ensure that Fort Smith is the location of the headquarters of the future Polytechnic University. I would also like to thank the Minister for agreeing to meet with the leadership of Fort Smith to discuss the transformation of the college. I will have questions for the Minister of Education later today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabatcha. Member Statements, Member Statements, Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, to find out that the extended care facility identified for Hay River has been delayed to 2728 came as a great disappointment, not only to me, but to the residents of Hay River and to those persons and families in need of the facility for loved ones. Mr. Speaker, when I heard of the decision to delay the project, it did not come as a surprise. I knew the reasons used would be multiple and would touch on insurance coverage, loss of utilities and flooding that occurred in the immediate area where the building is to be located. Mr. Speaker, upon visiting the site last weekend, looking at the available area and reviewing the footprint of the proposed building, there appears to be sufficient room to place the building well outside the area that was subjected to flooding. This, Mr. Speaker, would allow the project to proceed. Mr. Speaker, the logic used to delay the to delay construction, although reasonable, fails to account for the urgent need of those beds and services for the community. This project, originally based on 48 beds, was reduced to 24 on the premise that this government wanted to support the initiative of keeping seniors in their homes. The question is, what has this government provided in the way of additional home and medical supports for those seniors remaining in their homes? Have we increased home care hours, home care visits, and have we added additional support staff? Will we add to that if the project does not proceed? <coughs> Mr. Speaker, looking after one's family member at home is admirable, but is not realistic for some. Without the experience of patient care, with the rising cost of living, with minimal free time, families today are working just to make ends meet. This government does not appear to see much value in supporting those needing 24-7 care. Many who are seniors and who have provided so much to the NWT, Mr. Speaker, my priority has always and always will be the people. This government must make people a priority and it must 
place people first. Mr. Speaker, I will be asking the Minister of Health to revisit the decision on the extended care facility identified for Hay River and to either reposition the building on the proposed site or identify an alternate location at the earliest so this pr project can get back on track. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Kamlik. Mr. Speaker, I question whether the GNWT is meeting the spirit and intent of access to health care as defined under the Canada Health Act. Section 12, brackets 1A of the Canada Health Act defines accessibility under the program from which the GNWT receives full cash contribution payable <coughs> for health care services to each jurisdiction each fiscal year. Accessibility as defined under the program criteria states, the health care insurance plan of a province A must provide for insured health services on uniform terms and conditions, and it goes on to further say, quote, on a basis that does not impede reasonable access to those services by insured persons, end quote. But what is reasonable access, Mr. Speaker? Here in the NWT, GNWT employees are provided top-tier health care services over and above the delivery of health care for the public. Their medical travel benefit pays for the cost of hotels, per diems that reflect actual food costs, and do not pay a copay co for air travel. In the NWT, if you are a non-GNWT employee, you fall into a second-tier category, a copay system, $50 a night hotel subsidy, lower per diems, and different escort eligibilities. In addition to financial inequity, there is also growing access inequity. Many physicians are recommending patients travel to Calgary for some services given the longer wait times in Edmonton. But because medical travel only funds airfare to Calgary and not the Alberta city with the most timely available appointment, residents are often left to cover the additional travel on their own. For some, this is financially inaccessible and the ultimate cost is far greater than travel to Calgary, Mr. Speaker. But the GNWT health benefits have evolved to an income-based copay system one that I have heard directly from residents does not reflect the high cost of living in the NWT or additional costs many Northerners bear. Mr. Speaker, I am not advocating for a reduced benefit to public servants, but rather a system that entitles all residents to the same access to health care. I am advocating for the GNWT to use their own benefits as the gold benchmark for all NWT residents. Access to health care should be universal. I will have questions for the Minister of Health and Social Services later today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Nivik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it has come to my attention that a recent contract to build a duplex in Inuvik was awarded to a company that is not on the BIP registry. I'll be questioning the Minister of Housing as to why this happened. How does a local contractor in my riding lose out on work to a non-BIP company? Mr. Speaker, a long-time local Inuvik BIP business that detailed all the northern business it would use, things like hiring local suppliers and contractors and fully ad adhering to the BIP policy, a policy meant to give northern businesses a preference and to keep money in the north, Mr. Speaker. So it was a shocking to hear that the Housing Corporation gave a non-BIP business the same preference as a local long-time business, Mr. Speaker, that did not do the same. The BIP policy was give was to give northern businesses a 20% advantage for hiring locals as much as possible. In this instant, Mr. Speaker, businesses in my riding lost out on an opportunity for work by just 4%, Mr. Speaker, which in dollar amounts just around $65,000 to a non-BIP business, who for some reason got that same preference as a BIP business. Today I'll be asking when the Housing Corporation is going to support local businesses and ensure that the BIP policy is being followed, Mr. Speaker. The BIP policy needs to be followed or we should just tell our contractors now that they don't need to live here. They don't need to pay taxes here. They don't need to provide jobs and contribute to the economy here. And that they can just move south and come up, bring their workers, bid on jobs because there's no preference for businesses actually operating and living here. And if that's the case, that's not the government that I want to be part of, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The GNWT manages a $31 million lease portfolio. 
uh, that is larger than the budget of EIA lands. Uh, and, and of that $31 million, Mr. Speaker, $21 million goes to, to one company, that is the combined assets of, of Northview and Kingset. Uh, that's more than we presently provide our communities for water and sewer, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's a, we manage 109 leases for 626,000 square feet of office spaces. Uh, that's 12 Belonka buildings, Mr. Speaker, many of them in downtown Yellowknife. And, and Mr. Speaker, it is clear that that $20 million a year we provide to one company year after year for decades now has built up that monopoly such that one company owns the vast majority of commercial space in this town and a very significant portion of residential space. And yet, Mr. Speaker, we have done nothing at all to prevent this from happening. In fact, our, our leasing of commercial prop property policy is from 1998, and despite repeated requests to the Minister of Infrastructure, we have not amended this policy in over 20 years, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, getting a local developer to do any work in this town is becoming rarer and rarer. It's because the GNWT has strategically, over years of either neglect or on purpose, uh, refused to give them work. They have all gone to one company. Yet, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't believe I have to speak to the benefits of local ownership to anyone in this house. When you have local landlords, they are more willing to build buildings, they are more willing to work with people, they, they are willing to add to our desperately needed housing stock. But when you have multi-billion dollar foreign companies or multi-billion dollar REITs they, who Yellowknife is a rounding heir to it with them, they don't work with our local nonprofits, they don't work with our indigenous development corps, they don't work with local contractors, and they do absolutely nothing to address our housing crisis or address what we want our offices to look like. I will once again have questions for the Minister of Infrastructure of whether she is going to do anything at all to address the monopoly that we have created and we are responsible for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, on September 13th, Two uniformed officers arrived by helicopter at the Tai Dene Nene East Arm National Park. What followed can only be described as a raid, as officers proceeded to enter a cultural camp of 80 people, including LKDFN elders, children, and Indigenous university students and faculty from New Zealand. Under the threat of arrest, they had to stand by while ENR officers searched their dwellings and seized belongings. Elders stated the raid was reminiscent of their youth, and the experiences of their ancestors being persecuted by colonists for practicing their cultural ways and subsistence lifestyle. They felt it flew in the face of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship they signed 122 years ago. UNDRIP Article 11.1 .1 states, Indigenous peoples have the right to practice and revitalize their cultural traditions and customs. This includes the right to maintain, protect, and develop the past, present, and future manifestations of their cultures, such as archaeological and historical sites, artifacts, designs, ceremonies, technologies, visual and performing arts, and literature. Respecting Indigenous knowledge, cultures, and traditional practices contributes to sustainable and equitable development and proper management of the environment. In fact, Mr. Speaker, this is exactly the tenet that our world-renowned environmental co-management system is based on. In the NWT, where cultural genocide has led to serious addictions and mental health issues, and in a post-pandemic world that sees rising food insecurity and a cost of living, harvesting country food, hunting, and spending time on the land is an ideal way for Indigenous people to deal with the stress and combat some of the harsh realities they face daily. However, what was to be a much-needed time of healing and wellness on September 13th instead became a situation of traumatization and disrespect. Mr. Speaker, I'm not here to comment on the wastage. As the Minister has stated, we don't know what happened. However, what I do want to comment on was the utter lack of respect shown to the, LD, sorry, the LKDFN, their elders and children not to mention the guests visiting them. What impression did this make regarding Canada and how the GNWT treats Indigenous people? Mr. Speaker, the Minister states they attempted to contact the ban regarding this matter. When? Did the Minister try to mitigate the situation before the officers arrived? Mr. Speaker, if the authorities found something in my neighbourhood, are they going to show up at my door and push their way into my house looking for answers? I don't think so. Thank you. 
Thank you, member for Great Slave. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Nahende. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Pauline Ikotla Bertrand was born in Snare Lake. Her state. Sorry. In. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> was born in. Snake Lake River, B.C. on August 2nd, 1933. Her Denny name was Golia, little sister. Unfortunately, this is where her and her little brother, Sam, had lost their parents at a very young age. Not long afterwards, their grandmother, Margaret, took them home to Pretty Hill, which is known as La Julie's View, to live. From there, she was taught how to hunt, fish, trap, to which she passed on these teachings to her children. As a young lady, she married her husband, Francis Bertrand, and they settled down and made their home in Pretty Hill. This is where their 12 children were born and raised. Together, Pauline and Francis provided for their family by trapping, hunting, fishing from the land. It has been said that she worked very hard with no complaints. It was part of life. The little joke with the family was even taken to taking care of household chores such as laundry, which was no match for her. She was known for always being ready and willing to help her children with the task of providing and helping, look, help looking after their children when needed. As it could be seen, she loved each and every one of them. Pauline lived and loved the traditional lifestyle of the Denny people and enjoyed traveling with her family, whether it was on the river or on the land. She will always be remembered for her bannock, supply of dry meat, sewing, moose hide tanning, and other personal interests and hobbies, hobbies she would pick up. Mr. Speaker, Pauline will remember, we remembered for her beautiful smile, laugh, and she will always have a big hug for her loved ones. As it has been known that she loved to sing her favorite songs and sometimes known to dance. Pauline was preceded by her husband, brother, two sons, and two grandchildren. She leaved behind three daughters, five sons, and many grandchildren, great grandchildren, and great great grandchildren, and other nieces and nephews. Mr. Speaker, she'll be missed forever by her surviving family and friends. Thank you, Member for Nahende. Our thoughts and prayers are with the family and community at this time. Member statements. Member statements. Returns to oral questions. Returns to oral questions. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when this government is looking to delay projects, it has to <coughs> prioritize those that impact the most vulnerable. For Hay River, that is the extended care facility that supports seniors and persons who require 24-7 care. This facility is needed and cannot be delayed until 27-28. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Health confirm when the demolition of the H.H. Williams Memorial Hospital will be completed? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. The demolition of H.H. Williams Memorial Hospital is well underway and will be completed in this calendar year. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, will the minister confirm the reasoning behind delaying construction of the proposed extended care facility for Hay River? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the reason for the delay has to do with the flood. The flood, while it didn't flood Woodland Manor, uh, made services, water and sewer services, unavailable to uh, the site. And as a result, all of the residents had to be removed and relocated to other locations. And so we need to choose uh, a site for the uh, long-term care, which is not subject to those risks. It, it uh, is very difficult to move elders in an emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I uh, appreciate that answer. 
However, I think moving this, uh, moving to another site is, is one option. But I, my understanding as well is that you know we're looking. This government's looking at mitigation measures to ensure flooding doesn't happen. We're raising roads in the community and things like that. So there are other options. But Mr. Speaker, will the minister confirm if consideration has been given to repositioning the building on the site and tying it into the existing Woodland Manor facility? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the repositioning it on the site doesn't deal with the problems I mentioned around maintaining essential services to the building. Uh, certainly, repositioning could happen, but the maintenance of service is the, is the first thing that needs to happen. Um, what we're waiting for, and I know other departments are waiting for as well, is the, the new flood maps that will be created as a result of this flood. And the bottom line here is that if the building is not insurable, it can't be built in that location. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. To put the project back in schedule, is the minister committed to revisiting the decision to delay and consider other options, such as another usable site, which she appears to be doing? Thank you. Thank you, member for Haver South, minister responsible for health and social services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm pleased to report to the member that uh, the department has a jump on this. Our infrastructure staff have met with the town of Hay River to talk about an alternate site, and the leading contender is a site called Sundog, which is adjacent to the new health center, which did not flood in the spring. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Nevicton Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, well, can the minister explain to me how a non-BIP business gets VIP uh, preference in the Northwest Territories on housing contracts through housing NWT? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Housing NWT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member for the question as well, too. And I'm and it's, it's a quite complex question as well, and we're quite surprised to, to know of this, that we've, um, we've awarded a, a, a contract to a non-BIPT um, company. Um, but according to what I've received so far, that the evaluation was um, completed according to the BIP policy. There, was five BIPs, there were those five bids that were received. And um, as part of the process, the companies are provided a rating if they indicate they will be using local labor and these types of, ho these types of items with um, housing will ensure that it's being done. Um, I, will follow I will follow up with the department and, um, and making sure that these um, obligations are met um, and what uh, type of penalties are, are, um, are going to be exercised if, if these um, local contractors are not being used to fulfill the, the needs within the member's region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nevik Lakes. Mr. Speaker, I'm really confused here because, you know, the company that was awarded states that they will be using local content. So um, I'll be tabling a document later today to show that the local companies, the electricians, the heating and plumbing, the local supplier were not used. The trucking companies, the, the, I mean, the company had actually brought in all the supplies from the south just before I came back after the weekend. So how is this department going to review and ensure that the BIP po uh, process was fairly applied to our local BIP businesses? There's four of them that are BIPed and one that is not. And how does this contract get given to them with a 4% difference? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Housing NWT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, thank you to the member as well, too. And one thing with the portfolio is that we do have such a large housing rollout, and my, um, my commitment to, to the Northwest Territories is that we keep the um, majority of those contracts here in the North, and we are um, providing opportunities for small businesses and businesses within the, with the territory as well. 
Um, what has been provided to me is that the contractor did confirm with housing that they are using, um, uh, they are investing locally with the mechanicals that, that are required um, for the contract. But according to the member's statement, I will be following up with housing and looking forward um, to seeing if, if this is, um, has actually been fulfilled and um, exercising penalties if, the, if that is appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Nivik Tunlix. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm still confused because if this local company is going to use just the mechanical, what about the supplies? We know that the supplies have come in and they're from the south. What about the electrical? There's one electrical company there. We know that they're not using them. So I'm asking the minister to pull this contract and start awarding contracts if they're available. This is a local company and award it to a BIP company, not be given to our money to the South. This is a company that we've paid millions of dollars to rebuild their own bills and then having another co local contractors go in and fix their problems. So I'm asking the Minister to pull this contract and give it to a BIP company. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nivik Tun Lakes, Minister responsible for Housing and WT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and you know, thank you to the member for the question as well, too. And I just really would like to express that when these uh, contracts and these opportunities do go out, that the Indigenous groups are um, acknowledged first. There are letters that are, are out there and sent um, for interest if they're wanting to, um, want, wanting to pursue these contracts. I will have to pull this back for further evaluation and review um, and just uh, really look, uh, taking into deep considera consideration the um, the comments from the member. I, I take this very seriously and I will be reviewing that within the department. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Nevik Tunlix. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, we've got Crown Corporations, we've got the Housing NWT, we've got the Northwest Territories Power Corp, we've got NTEC, we've got all these Crown Corporations that our money is flowing through to, you know, and if we're not following one policy that can flow through all of our public dollars that we all have to apply to, then what are we doing? We need to follow one procurement policy within our government, within our Crown corporations, and so we can't be saying, well, in this department we do this, and in this department we do this. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, what I want to do is if this, if the NWT Housing Corp Minister will be looking at our policy to ensure that it aligns with our new procurement policy and that it aligns with BIP policy so that we are doing what we say we are going to do for the people of the Northwest Territories, the residents, the locals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Housing and WT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question as well, too. And housing does follow the, follow the GNWT procurement policy as well. And uh, like I had mentioned, I take this very seriously. I want to bring this back to the department and, um, and uh, provide a further response to the member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Thabacha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Education explain what the distinction is, if any, about the term administrative centre versus university headquarters in reference to the Tabacha campus for the future Polytechnic University? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Tabacha, Minister responsible for education, culture and employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and of course I don't speak for the college. Uh, this House passed uh, changes to amendments to the Aurora College Act, which has significantly changed my role in relation to the college. Um, so the, the college has adopted the term administrative centre to acknowledge that the staff who support corporate administrative functions of the college are in Fort Smith. Um, so that is why they're using that term. It, it's a term that's commonly used in post-secondary environments. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, uh, just for clarity, it's just one staff member that's doing that, okay? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, does the minister agree with the statement that the term headquarters in reference to the university campus is solely a government term? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Thabacha, Minister responsible for EC&E. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to single out any individual staff member. That's inappropriate. It's against the rules of this House, so I'm going to leave it at that. That's the term Aurora College uses. That's the term the institution uses. The idea of a university headquarters is something that is it's not really used in post-secondary institutions. Colleges and universities don't distinguish one campus from another by calling one a headquarters and one, you know, a subservient. Each campus has different roles. Sometimes they have different um, uh, uh, colleges of part of the same university. So every, uh, every campus has its own role. Um, I can leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, uh, clarity on uh, a term is not singling out one person. For the record, Mr. Speaker, does the Minister agree and support the notion that Fort Smith is the education capital of the NWT, as proclaimed by the former Commissioner in 1967? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha. Minister responsible for ec &E. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not aware that that would be an official designation, but I think that given the number of um, jobs in, in, in Fort Smith that are education related, the amount of money that the GNWT flows to the community in terms of education, uh, probably more per capita than anywhere else in the territory. I think in that sense, um, yes, the, the Fort Smith is the education capital. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, Member for Thabacha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for acknowledging that. Mr. Mi Mr. Speaker, can the Minister once again assure me and the constituents of the Bacha that the primary campus for the future Polytechnic University will be in Fort Smith? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha, Minister responsible for ECE. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I stated, each campus uh, serves a, a purpose in, in Fort Smith. That's where the administration of the college takes place, and there's no intention to change that. The other campuses each have uh, their roles as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Camley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the Minister of Health and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if the Minister can let us know how the GNWT sets the per diems, hotel subsidy, and copay amounts for medical travel. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the question. I want to say, uh, to start with, that access to health care. Um, while it, it's determined by whether someone is Indigenous, Métis, on a private health care plan or a public health care plan, um, access is the same. That is guaranteed under the Canada Health Act. How you get to that medical treatment, I think, is what the member wants to hear about. So the medical travel program is in place not to uh, reimburse residents for everything that they spend, but rather to reduce the financial barrier uh, of traveling for, for a service that's not provided here. So um, it, the benefit program uh, is provided by GNWT on par with NIHB uh, and, and the Métis Health Benefit Plan. The, the situation is that if uh, a, a person has a, an income of under $80,000 a year, they're eligible to stay at a boarding home which provides both accommodation and food. If they have a higher income or they choose not to stay at the boarding home, then the per diem is uh, 20, uh, sorry, $68 uh, per day. And, and that's been the case since 2003. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kamlik. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, the costs have gone up substantially, especially over the last couple of years here. And I'm wondering if Health and Social Services intends to increase the per diems and hotel subsidy that they offer to make it more in line with the costs that uh, residents are actually incurring when they travel south. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Uh, the medical travel program has a number of reviews ongoing in this fiscal year, and that includes uh, the per diem 
rate, which, which we've been uh, referencing here, and mileage rates, as well as um, the exceptions policy, the escort criteria, um, a, a formal and a, f a number of formal definitions, uh, such as nearest center uh, and the air ambulance uh, transportation um, policy. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Camley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in my member's statement, I spoke about the GNWT benefit program for medical travel really being the gold standard in the Northwest Territories and one that I think all residents would like the opportunity to have access to. So I'm wondering if the minister can speak to what the cost would be to provide medical travel benefits to all residents equal to that received of the of GNWT employees. Thank you. Thank you, member for Cam Lake, minister responsible for health and social services. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, the NWT medical travel program is for people who uh, don't have uh, private uh, means to travel through their employer benefits, for example, whether those are public employers like the GNWT or they are private employers. Um, the the uh, medical travel program fills uh, that gap. Um, in terms of, uh, of who gets these benefits, in the GNWT, <laughs> the, the medical travel benefits are part of the compensation package for uh, staff, and so they, they have them on that basis through their collective agreement. In the last fiscal year, the medical travel program spent $43 million uh, for approximately 15,000 cases. So with 45,000 people in the territory, let's triple that and say it's $150 million to provide even the level of benefits we have now to, to everyone. So there is no cost estimate. I can just say that it is going to be tens of millions of dollars over what we spend today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Cam Lake. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, would the minister be willing to look at a policy change as, as well that would allow uh, travel to Calgary for, for medical travel patients? Right now, uh, what patients are seeing or what uh, constituents are seeing is that there's additional wait times in order for waiting for appointments available in Edmonton and that medical travel won't cover the travel to get to Calgary for appointments of the same nature but that are available much sooner. And so I'm wondering if this change can be made at a policy level. This would save on uh, administrative burdens associated with appeals and would also provide timelier health care service to NWT residents. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Um, the, way, the way that the referrals work now is that we have um, an agreement with Alberta Health Services to provide, um, as a first response, um, care and services in Edmonton. And the, the uh, associated support services, such as the Largo Boarding Home and um, uh, medical travel contracts and so on, all uh, support that Edmonton location. I don't have any information about the relative waiting lists of Edmonton versus Calgary, which would be an important dimension to consider here. Um, and also, uh, the, a, another thing to consider would be uh, whether uh, whether Alberta Health Services would provide the same care in Calgary as they as they do in in Edmonton, so uh, th those are some interesting things to take up. Um, what I need to say uh, about that as well is that if someone is referred to specialized care in Calgary, the medical travel will pay for them to have that specialized care in Calgary versus Edmonton. If people are accessing care themselves that without being referred by the, uh, the NWT healthcare system, then the cost of medical travel is on them, as is the cost if they are using a private clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, before I ask my question, I just want to state that I do not uh, uh, 
I have a lot of empathy for the, uh, the people that had to execute the orders of the Department of ENR, and it is not them that I am criticizing in this. Uh, so my questions are for the Minister of ENR. Uh, when did the department reach out to Chief Marlowe to request a face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the incident? And when the minister does have that meeting, could we please have a copy of it and minutes from the meeting? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave, Minister Responsible for Environment and Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's two questions in here, so I'm just going to answer the first one. Uh, as soon as the the search warrant issue was addressed. Um, we then sent out the letter because it was in the courts. We sent the letter to uh, Chief Marlowe and he has received it and we've confirmed it with his staff today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that letter is dated as of yesterday after getting questions in this House, and it's my understanding it went to the wrong address for the Chief and not the SAO. My question, though, is, however, the yesterday the Minister said with respect to the raid that it, quote, hasn't been proven it was unlawful. However, the search warrant was thrown out by the courts. So is it not logical, then, that that search was unlawful? Uh, is this really just not a game of semantics? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Great Slave, Minister Responsible for Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we followed the process. It's not semantics. We followed the process. We got a search warrant, and we did the executed the search warrant, not a raid. It was an execution of a search warrant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, why didn't the Minister consider reaching out ahead of time in order to mitigate this situation with the LKDFN? This is what we've been talking about since we took office, was doing things res properly and respectfully with the First Nations. Given that the warrant was thrown out, I think that there could have been a lot of things done here to not have had this happen to traumatize women and children and foreign dignitaries. Therefore, can the Minister answer whether or not he thought about mitigating this and contacting the Chief ahead of time? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave, Minister Responsible for ENR. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there was an investigation. I don't get involved in the investigation. We have reached out to Chief Marlowe. We've set up a time, um, and we are working with that. We are trying to resolve this and move forward. But I need to stress that the investigation is still ongoing, so I don't know all the matters that are into that, and I don't want to have any political interference on this. Same as what we did with uh, illegal hunts in the mobile zone. Officers do their work, then it's brought to my attention after they do their work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So what I hear is the minister doesn't know what's going on in his department and he's not interested in mitigating this with uh, the First Nations in a respectful manner. Will the minister apologize to the LKDFN for this inappropriate raid on their people and their wellness camp, elders and children? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Great Slave, Minister Responsible for Environment and Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, the member from Tunaday Welladay, a member that in that riding, asked the same thing. As I said yesterday, and I'll say it here today, I've reached out to Chief Marlowe to have a meeting in their community to have this conversation and how we move forward. That's what I've promised, and that's what I will continue to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's, there's no coherent reporting of how much we spend on leasing and how much that, and who it goes to, that you can go into the contracts, but the problem is, is we inherited quite a few of these leases from the, the federal government upon devolution, and some of these leases are 20 years old, and they just seem to be renewed every time they come up. So uh, I'm hoping the minister can provide me some updated figures on, on how much we paid Northview uh, since this assembly started. Uh, I suspect it's a number that just continually climbs every year, but I, I can't actually confirm that with public information. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we're not able to divulge proprietary information specific to a single landlord. 
infrastructure continues to follow leasing of improved real estate policy, which includes obtaining leases through the public procurement unless directed by the Executive Council, which is made up of the Premier and the Ministers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I'm not sure that, that that is proprietary information. I can go to the contracts reports and filter out who wins leases uh, and who we're paying money to. Uh, it's not all there. As I said, many of these leases are, are well over 20 years old. Uh, and, and I think that lines up with what the minister said, that our current leasing of improved real property policy is well over 20 years old. I'm not remotely convinced that we are in compliance with it. It does require us to be con doing continuous uh, value for money analysis, uh, and it does require us to continue analyze whether it is uh, cheaper to own buildings versus leasing them. But all that being said, uh, it, it's a 20-year-old policy that has not been updated. Is the minister willing to update our current leasing of improved real property policy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the member is aware that the GWT is currently going through a procurement review. Once the procurement review has concluded, the Department of Infrastructure has committed to work with the Department of Executive and Indigenous Affairs and other stakeholder departments to bring forward proposed amendments to the leasing of real property policy. It's important that any amendments to this policy are aligned with the outcomes of this procurement review. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm glad to hear that, and maybe I'll have some questions about when we can finally wrap up this uh, procurement review. Uh, my, my next question is, you know, I, we're talking about multiple office towers here. I recognize we're not going to empty a 10-story uh, commercial office building uh, overnight. I think it's going to take probably a decade or two of concerted effort to actually adjust this percentage that grows every single year to one company. But, but I think a first step would be reviewing when we put leases out, whether they could be in smaller chunks, uh, whether we could work with departments that, you know, perhaps they don't all need to be on eight floors of one building, and we could break that up into some smaller, more feasible things to get local ownership, uh, especially here in Yellowknife, where it, it is such a monopoly. I, I'm wondering if the minister will apply that lens to when we go out on further leases. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Actually, reviewing space needs in that way is an approach we use regular <laughs> when, de when developing RFPs. It is a consideration when we are approached by departments to obtain, renew space for a program. How much of this space needs to be grouped together? and what can be split into smaller spaces, recognizing that this may create opportunities for uh, smaller local landlords. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Yellowknife North. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad the minister that the department is already doing that, but I think it, it needs a little bit of a review because clearly it's not working if the end goal is, is local ownership. It, it, it's clear if you look at the city of Yellowknife skyline, uh, we don't have local ownership. Almost every single building is owned by some multi-billion dollar region. Uh, so my question is, you know, I, I think actually a number of companies, perhaps indigenous development corps, if you gave them enough notice, three, five years out, that you were looking to renew a very long term, large lease, and you were perhaps willing to make it a little longer term, they would actually build us a building, Mr. Speaker. I, I think a lot of different groups have been looking at this as a possibility, uh, including some of our housing leases. So I, I'm just wondering if the minister is w willing to look and work with some local potential development corporations or landlords, give them some notice, and, and see if we can enter into a negotiated contract, if someone will actually build us some leasing space. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member spoke about um, an approach that we can do to um, involve local um, 
local owners. It is an approach that we use sometimes, but mostly through a public procurement process. So in the terms of the RFP, it would allow sufficient time to schedule, to allow landlords to uh, propose new building and long-term lease. This approach was used in several places, Mr. Speaker, including uh, Hay River at the Hay River Health Social Service Accommodation Office Building. It was used at the new Fort McPherson Office Building. And procurement is currently underway for the uh, Territorial Fire Center in Fort Smith. All of these leases, Mr. Speaker, allow for local landlords to build new buildings and lease it back to the GWT. So we're getting there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Mumphrey. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is further to my member statement on treatment program that I did on October 20th. So it's for Minister of Health and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, in the House on October 19, 2022, the Premier noted that the Council of Leaders identified mental health and addiction and community-based treatment as some of the primary issues for NWT residents. With that in mind, the Minister of Health committed to provide me with a number of NWT residents who have accessed treatment services since 2013. Have these statistics been provided? When does the Minister anticipate providing these st statistics back to me? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumphrey, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank you to the member for the question. I do not have those responses here today, and I haven't been given a date they're available, but I will commit now to making sure she has them before the session is over. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Mumphrey. Thank you. Um, yes, um, what initiative does NTHSSA currently have to ensure they provide residents with culturally safe addiction services following the Auditor General's report. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfoy, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in response to the uh, Office of the Auditor General's report, we created a work plan which details our response to each of the recommendations, and we, accept, we accepted all the recommendations. Um, we have, uh, as the, the member may know, a whole division within the department called Community Culture and Innovation that looks at culturally appropriate services. And uh, to that end, they, they've done extensive training with staff. Uh, they ensure that there is, uh, when people uh, do go south for, uh, res for uh, facility-based treatment, that there, there is appropriate cultural safety provisions in place. So uh, that, that's just a very uh, scattergun approach to the answer. But I, I do want to assure the member that it's top of mind. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Mumphrey. Yes, thank you. During, during or, oral questions on October 20th, um, I asked if the Minister Green would commit to reopening an addiction-based facility and treatment and wellness center in the Northwest Territories, and the, res the Minister responded no. She said that this, um, she said, the, sim the simple reason that we don't have a treatment center is because they don't work. We tried four times the effort to provide one treatment center for all the regions, languages, and culture. Culture has not, has not been successful. People do not attend. So can the minister provide the number of residents who attended the previous treatment center in the NWT? Member for Mumphrey, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't have with me information about how many people attended the four previous treatment centers that were offered in the, uh, in the NWT, but I will uh, ask the department if they can produce 
uh, that information. I also want to say that um, we have had a preliminary conversation at the Council of Leaders about alternatives to one single facility uh, for healing and treatment, which is what the member asked for, to see if there is something that could be developed on a regional basis that would better meet the needs of both treatment closer to home and the particular languages and cultures of the NWT, each in a regional setting. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Colleagues, before we continue, uh, could you please check your phones? I could hear, hear it vibrating on silent, so we could just put it to silent. It would be most helpful. Thank you. Final supplementary member for what? Uh, Mumfui. I was going to ask um, that. I was going to ask, so, but can the minister provide data to support the statement that treatment centers do not work? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the one uh, facility that I'm more familiar with is Natsa JK. Natsa JK was never more than one third full during uh, the time that it was open. Uh, and the, uh, the program cycled through 30 days for men and 30 for women. And so if you uh, wanted to seek treatment um, and they were early into the opposite cycle, then you would uh, have to wait potentially uh, seven to eight weeks for, for intake. Um, there was a problem uh, c attracting and keeping qualified staff. So, uh, so what we've found is that since we started contracting the southern um, facility-based treatment, the number of people who are accepted into that and who are able to access it in a, in a uh, speedier way and a, a wider variety of options, including uh, co-ed options as well as specific to men and women, the number of people who are accessing the services more than double. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to go back to the extended care facilities and uh, questions for the Minister of Health. Uh, Mr. Speaker, construction costs uh, for the extended, extended care facility will likely move upwards with a six-year delay. Will the Minister confirm if her department has considered this in their decision to delay the pro when they delay in the project and any idea what that cost may be? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, um, the cost estimate that is currently available has a contingency built into it, but there's a very important but. If the site changes and it is no longer going to be where the old H.H. H. Williams Hospital was, and it's now going to be over near the new health centre, uh, the um, getting the land ready for the construction it has not been factored into that cost and so those costs may in fact rise. Thank you. Thank you Minister. Oral questions. Member for Haver South. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, with the delay, like we're going to need beds for, uh, you know, for uh, people who are going to be requiring them in the next six years. So Mr. Speaker, will the Minister confirm what the plan is for the older portion of Woodland Manor? as we will, need, we will need those beds. And my understanding from past discussions is that, there will require, that it will require major repairs such as roofing, mechanical, and interior upgrades if we delay this project. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. My understanding is that there was an addition built on uh, Manor and opened in 2018 to uh, provide nine new rooms that were previously part of H.H. H. Williams Hospital, which was at that point being phased out. So there's the newer part and the older part. The older part is uh, has a, a life of approximately 10 years remaining. Um, and to verify that, we have asked the Department of Infrastructure to do a technical evaluation next spring on the existing Woodland Manor to confirm the uh, useful life it has um, left. Now, if the new long-term care is not attached to Woodland Manor, then likely the money will go to the new long-term care rather than to Woodland Manor. Uh, this 
is going to have to be resolved uh, through the bed allocation because, uh, we, as the member has said, we're, we're looking um, at, uh, I think it's a 16-bed facility for, for Hay River. So if we're going to take the current Woodland Manor offline, we would have to account for those residents plus uh, the number that we've already committed to. The, the last thing I'll say about this is that the current wait list in Hay River is four. Uh, so it, it is, um, well, a problem for those four families, not, not a problem that, uh, that we can't solve with the current projection. Thank you. Mr. Oral Questions, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I understand that, you know, the, the wait list is, is, might be short, but in six years, uh, you know, I might be on it. So, Mr. Speaker, if the project is delayed to 27-28, will the minister confirm what additional funds will be provided to the Hay River Health and Social Services to expand <coughs> home care supports and services while we are waiting for a facility? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Hay River South, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. <coughs> Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member better watch out, or maybe by then I'll be a personal support worker, <laughs> helping him get in and out. So um, just pray that doesn't happen. Um, so what we've been able to do to uh, supplement home care is um, provide funding for three additional positions in the last two years uh, so that there is more staff available because, the, in fact, there are uh, two... There are, uh, greater demands for that. We've also um, provided, oh, pardon me, the detail there is that's two home care nurses and a home support worker. Um, the additional nursing position has enabled us to uh, cr create more hours of service. So the service hours are now 8.30 to 4.30, seven days a week. Um, we've also um, got the pay Paid Family Caregiver Program active in Hay River, and that um, is in place for this fiscal year and next. So we have a variety of supports that are available, and more are likely to come uh, as we go further into uh, implementing the home care review, which was completed in 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for Hay River South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the minister confirm if delaying the project to 27-28 will trigger a re-evaluation of the number of beds required, possibly from uh, a, an increase uh, from uh, 24 up to 48 or 60? Thank you. Thank you, member for the River South, minister responsible for health and social services. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the reason um, that the the beds were were the bed evaluation was redone is because we had better information from 10 years of, of data, as well as better population projections. Um, following the the reevaluation, we committed to further reevaluations every four years. So there is every possibility that the number will change, and we will we will build the facility to uh, to meet. The, the need that we know of, the most recent need that we know of. One of the reasons that Hay River uh, bed size went down is because it turned out there was a greater need in Fort Smith, so it made sense to build two long-term care facilities, one in Hay River and one in Fort Smith, so that people could continue to uh, live as close as home to possible. We understand that that's a priority and that home care um, assists with uh, that priority, which is part of our mandate. Um, I also just want to mention uh, for those uh, those people who are on waiting lists at any, anywhere in the territory that has a long-term care facility, there are respite beds available that families can book if they need a longer-term break. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's become a bit of a tradition for me uh, to ask about the Fort Good Seniors Home uh, every session, which is proving that not all traditions are good, but it, it's been 20 months since the minister uh, opened that facility. Uh, and my question for the Minister of Housing is, uh, when can we expect it to actually open? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Housing and WT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, we did end up with a lot of uh, different um, 
contractual situations, I guess, within and, and talks with the, with the um, fire marshal as well, too, which caused a huge, significant delay. Um, housing NWT is aiming for April 1st of 2023 of this year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, you know, admittedly, I've been asking about this for, for quite a while now, and I'm still not really sure what occurred here. You know, I, initially, I thought it was just our usual fight with the fire marshal, but, but it, it clears clear there's some larger contractual issues or contracting issues. Uh, can the minister just try and, you know, in simple terms, explain to me what exactly has occurred here? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Housing and WT. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and thank you to the member as well, too, that, you know, this, um, this uh, nine plex is actually in my riding, and I've had quite uh, um, uh, further conversations with the leadership as well, too, because they're quite anxious for this building to, to open immediately. Um, but we have been informing um, leadership as well, too, as we progress and try to uh, get this building open. We did have a lot of deficiencies within the building, and I just uh, I would like to follow up with the member um, as well too. I don't know if it's uh, I don't feel that it's appropriate to be speaking about that because we did have some issues with with the with the previous contractor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm. Thank you, member. Minister, sorry. Uh, oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, I. I think at some point the, the public record probably needs to, to clarify what exactly occurred here and maybe that's once we've opened the building and it's all finally said and done there's perhaps some lessons to be learned but I you know I imagine that since it's been so long this is uh, not going to be cheap does the minister have an estimate of what we expect this all to uh, additionally cost us thank you Mr. Speaker thank you member for Yellowknife North minister responsible for housing and WT uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question as well, too, as this uh, seniors complex is, is, is a priority in, in the community of Fort Good Hope as well, too, and we do have elders who are eagerly waiting to be moved into, these, into this facility, but um, right now I don't have a, a tallied up number of what this is actually costing us right now. I'd have to follow up with the member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions. Member for Mumfrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If previous treatment center, this is same, um, this is going out to um, question four, Minister of Health and Social Services. If previous treatment center did not work in the NWT, what has the GNWT learned from this? Did the GNWT consider that GNWT was not implementing the treatment program effectively, rather than suggesting addiction treatment facilities? Facilities do not work. I would like to hear from Minister Health and Social Services her thought on this. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what I've learned in the two years that I've been uh, in this role is that um, people want options when it comes to, uh, to achieving their sobriety. Uh, they want the option of being on the land, in the community, in order to protect their privacy and not, in, not to engage with people who are also from the NWT. They want the option to go to different places. So uh, what, what I've learned is that choice is really important. Telling people they have one place and only one place and one way to go for treatment uh, ha has not been successful. And just as a matter of clarification, NASA JK was operated by a non-profit organization, not by the GNWT, although the GNWT, of course, funded the cost of people to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Mumfui. Okay. What has the GNWT learned to do differently in regards to addiction treatment based on past experiences already tried? And how will the GNWT approach treatment program differently? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm, I'm not able to speak uh, in a very informed way about the content of treatment programs. I, I, ha I am not in a position to deliver them. I, I'm not in a position to need them, fortunately. So I, I can't give any detail to, to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, oral questions, written questions. Written questions. Member for Great Slave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my questions are for the Minister of uh, Education, Culture and Employment. The Child and Youth Care Counselling Initiative is one of the Government of the Northwest Territories programs intended to increase mental health supports for children and youth. The initiative was administered by the Department of Education, Culture and Employment until its multi-phased, multi-year transition to the Department of Health and Social Services. In its action plan, in response to the 2020 Auditor General's report recommendations, the Department of Education, Culture and Employment committed to improving mental health counselling services to children and youth to improve JK-12 student outcomes in the Northwest Territories by supporting the regions with 42 child and youth care counsellors and seven clinical supervisors. Action plan, page 21, commitment 4.6. I submit the following questions to the Minister of ECE. One, can the minister explain what engagement or consultation the Department of Education, Culture and Employment conducted with counsellors already working in the school system prior to implementing the new child youth care counsellor positions? Two, can the minister detail the qualifications typically accepted for child and youth care counsellors in place in our school system? Three, do school principals get to evaluate the child and youth care counsellors? Four, is there a way for school administrators to speak formally to the effectiveness of this program operating in the schools? And five, what evaluative feedback mechanisms are in place to assess the effectiveness of the Child and Youth Care Counselors Program? My second set is for the Minister of Health and Social Services. The Child and Youth Care Counseling Initiative is one of the Government of the Northwest Territories programs intended to increase mental health supports for children and youth. The initiative was administered by the Department of Education, Culture and Employment until its multi-phase, multi-year transition to the Department of Health and Social Services. I submit the following questions to the Minister of Health and Social Services. One, can the Minister explain how the Department of Health and Social Services prepared for the new child youth care counsellor positions? For example, did the Department consult with existing child youth care counsellors and were other programs consulted on the integration into the Department's existing activities? Two, can the Minister explain the turnover rate for child and youth care counsellors? Three, can the Minister describe how the child and youth care counsellors work with school administration? Four, can the Minister describe how the Department of Health and Social Services works with school administrators to evaluate the effectiveness of the program? And five, has there been any reporting or results produced from the Child and Youth Care Counselor Program? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Great Slave. Written questions. Written questions. Returns for written questions. Returns for written questions. Replies to the Commissioner's address. Replies to the Commissioner's address. Petitions. Petitions. Reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of standing and special committees. Reports of standing and special committees. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Minister responsible for infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table the following document. Energy Initiatives Report 2021-2022. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Member for Nevictoon Lakes. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table a letter from a constituent to the Minister of Industry, Tourism, Investment, dated October 25, 2021, regarding the business incentive policy enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevictoon Lakes. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Notices of motion. Notices of motion. Motions. Motions. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. Notice is a motion for the first reading of bills. First reading of bills. First reading of bills. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to present 
to the House Bill 58, an act to amend the Legislative Assembly and Executive Council Act, to be read for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Pursuant to Rule 8.2, Bracket 3, Bill 58, an act to amend the Legislative Assembly and Executive Council Act, is deemed read for the first time and is now ready for second reading. First reading of bills. First reading of bills. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to present to the House Bill 59, an act to amend the Elections and Plebiscites Act, to be read for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver Her South. Colleagues, pursuant to Rule 8.2, Brackets 3, Bill 59, an act to amend the Elections and Plebiscites Act, is deemed read for, for the first time and is now ready for second reading. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to go back to um, recognition of uh, seek unanimous consent to go to number five on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Nahende. Colleagues, the Member for Nahende is seeking unanimous consent to return to item five recognition of visitors in the gallery. Are there any nays? There are no nays. Member for Nahende. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize the former chief from uh, Jean Marie River, but also the grand chief, former grand chief for Dacho First Nation. Now she has moved out of the, the handy riding and has moved into the Dacho, so I'd like to recognize her and thank you for come, being here today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for the Hende. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Member for Cam Lake. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if we're going back, I might as well recognize my youngest son, Dallin Bowden, who has joined us in the gallery today. Thank you. Recognition of visitors in the gallery, member for Yellowknife Centre. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I see that Doreen Cleary is in the gallery, and I would like to acknowledge her and welcome her to the house. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Member for Satu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would also like to um, welcome Ms. Doreen Cleary. She is uh, originally from the Satu, but resides here in Yellowknife. Must see. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Member for Satu. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Second reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Consideration and Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters. Bill 23-29-53, Committee Report 37-19, brackets 2. Table document 723-19, brackets 2. With member for Nevik Twin Lake Signature. I now call Committee of a Whole to order. What is the wish of committee? Member for Cam Lake. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, committee wishes to deal with Bill 53, an act to amend the Liquor Act, in table document 723-19, brackets 2, 2023-2024, capital estimates, education, culture, and employment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Does committee agree? Thank you, committee. We will take a short recess and resume with the first item.
Committee of the Whole back to order. Committee, we've agreed to consider Bill 53, an act to amend the Liquor Act. I will ask the Minister of Finance to introduce the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm here to introduce Bill 53, an act to amend the Liquor Act. This bill proposes four administrative amendments to the Liquor Act that would benefit from immediate attention. First, updating personal importation limits to increase the quantities of liquor that a person may bring with them into the Northwest Territories. Second, removing enforcement as part of the Northwest Territories Liquor Licensing Board's role due to potential conflict of interest. Third, removing the ban on licensed applicants who have been charged with but not convicted of a criminal offence, which is necessary for consistency with the legal principle of innocent until proven guilty. And fourth, officially updating the name of the Northwest Territories Liquor Commission to include cannabis. The legislative amendments proposed in Bill 53, as well as the more other significant changes that the Department is working towards through the Holistic Liquor Legislative Review, will ultimately support liquor legislation in the Northwest Territories becoming more nimble, modern, streamlined, and responsive to the needs of residents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Would you like to bring witnesses into the chamber? Thank you. Sergeant at Arm, please escort the witnesses into the chamber. Minister, would you please introduce your witnesses? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on my left is Billy Mackay, the Deputy Minister of Finance, and on my right is Stephen Flanagan. He is the drafter from Legal Division. Thank you. I will now open the floor to general comments on Bill 53. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Bill 53, an act to amend the Liquor Act, received second reading in the Assembly on May 31, 2022, and was referred to the Standing Committee on Government Operations for a review. On October, 20, October 7, 2022, committee held a public hearing with the Minister of Finance and completed its clause-by-clause -clause review of the bill. The committee received no submissions on this bill. I thank committee for their efforts in reviewing this legislation. I have no comments at this time, but individual members may have additional questions or comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Committee, are there further questions, comments? Member for Cam Lake. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, the Minister referenced in her opening remarks that uh, the Department is working towards Phase 2 of this Act, and I'm wondering if the Minister can provide a commitment as to when we will see the bill brought forward on the floor of this House for Phase 2. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not in a position to give a specific time uh, at this stage. I am live uh, to comments from committee uh, regarding their interest in the larger piece of this, and I have certainly been working in the last little while with the department towards uh, being in a position to give a more specific timeline. It is certainly my expectation that we will still see the completion of the larger act uh, within the life of this government, but again, I'm just at a stage of being able to, to confirm that hopefully, hopefully before the end of this sitting. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Are there any further questions, comments? Is the committee agreed that there are no further general comments? Can we proceed to a clause-by-clause -clause review of the bill? Okay, committee, we will defer the bill number and title until after consideration of the clauses. Please turn to page one of the bill. Clause one, does committee agree? Clause two, does committee agree? Clause three, does committee agree? Clause four, does committee agree? Clause five, does committee agree? Clause six, does committee agree? Clause seven, does committee agree? Clause eight, does committee agree? And clause nine, does committee agree? Committee to the bill as a whole, does the committee agree that Bill 53, an act to amend the Liquor Act, is now ready for third reading? Thank you, committee. Does the committee agree that this concludes our consideration of Bill 53, an act to amend the Liquor Act? Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to your witnesses. Sergeant at Arms, please escort the witness from the chamber.
Committee, we've agreed to consider table document 723-19 brackets 2 capital estimates 2023-2024. We will now consider the Department of Education, Culture and Employment. Does the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment wish to bring witnesses into the chamber? Yes, I do. Thank you. Sergeant at Arm, please escort the witnesses into the chamber. Minister, would you please introduce your witnesses? To my left, I have Deputy Minister John McDonald, and to my right is Assistant Deputy Minister of Corporate Services Sam Shannon. Welcome. Committee has agreed to forego general comments. Has the committee agreed to proceed to the detail contained in the table document? Committee, the Department of Education, Culture, and Employment begins on page 17. And we will defer the departmental totals and review the estimates by activity summary beginning at page 19 with junior kindergarten to grade 12 school services with information on page 20. Education, culture and employment, junior kindergarten to grade 12 school services, infrastructure investment, $5,623,000. Is there any questions? This committee, no. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I recall last capital budget we passed these three portables for Colville Lake, and the intention there was to that was going to act as their school. Well, it was completed, but I, I see now there's been a change here where Colville Lake School has has been changed from being built to a planning designation. Can can I just get a bit of an update of what the current plan is, or what's going on with the Colville Lake School? Thank you. Thank you, Member Minister of ECNE. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, the member mentioned two projects in this capital plan, Colville Lake School Planning and Colville Lake School Three Portables. Uh, the three portables are in the process of being constructed. They will be on the winter road in the, in the new year and they will be set up and ready for school in the upcoming school year. The school itself is still in the planning phase. As the members are aware, uh, we have adjusted how we um, budget uh, for capital and so we are only budgeting for the planning phase which is what we actually expect to spend uh, we're not budgeting for um, you know builds that we're not going to do so the we've been working with uh, the band in Colville Lake they have wanted to take the lead on this project so we have provided them with funding to do the work that uh, the department would normally do in the lead up to uh, the development of a, an infrastructure project and so they are doing that work thank you thank you minister member for Yellowknife North yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I recall, uh, you know, I, I don't recall what is public or not, but at one point there was some back and forth with the community because they perhaps had much larger intentions uh, of what this school would be, you know, <coughs> including perhaps some community-based uh, infrastructure in it. Uh, I, yeah, I'm just hoping if I can get a bit more of an update on how that work is going with. Colville Lake and whether you know this is, is going to be the kind of super school that it, it was initially planned as or whether this is going to be just the school that is in compliance with our current kind of infrastructure guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Member Minister. Thank you. So uh, what we've asked is for the band to uh, put together a proposal for a school according to the capital standards. Uh, education, culture, and employment's capital standards on, on school projects, and then as well um, a plan for anything additional that they would like, so that we have a, a sort of a base model uh, to go f to go off of, and then uh, we can look at additional uh, you know, additional things that usually aren't in schools, and, and figure out if there's ways to uh, find funding to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. And can the minister just uh, 
remind me where childcare spaces kind of have landed in this debate. I know we have new capital standards and I believe there was some intention when communities wanted to put childcare spaces directly in schools. Uh, it, yeah, I guess I'm more generally speaking. Is that now our goal or is that uh, kind of dependent on the individual school? Thank you. Thank you, Minister Vicini. Thank you. So the, the new capital standards which were approved in 2020 include provisions for childcare spaces in a school facility if the spaces are warranted. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions, comments? Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. With a number of schools there that you know that that's within the department and uh, some of the work that I see happening, uh, one of the area one of the concerns I always have is uh, barrier free access uh, when we're in our designs and whether you know whether all schools uh, even if they're aged uh, you know if, if they're uh, you know being retrofitted to ensure that we have barrier free access for for all children and the employees. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Vicini. Thank you, and uh, the way this uh, planning for capital works is that the department uh, gathers up all of the different um, wants from the, the different school boards, uh, as well as information about the state of all the different capital assets from the Department of Infrastructure, and then we make assessments as to what can be done with the budget, and we, uh, we sometimes have enough for a, a new school or a retrofit, as well as a few, a couple small capital projects, and the things the member is referencing, accessibility, um, ensuring older schools are accessible, uh, those are my priority for when I look at the, the smaller capital uh, projects that we can advance and I, I would have to, I think it's probably the departments as well, I think we might have been on the same page when I first got into, uh, into this portfolio, but yes, we, I do prioritize those when looking at uh, what projects to advance, thank you. Thank you, member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the other thing, you know, uh, when I think of schools, you know, I think of, uh, you know, a healthy uh, learning environment. I think of, uh, you know, healthy children, and uh, you know that improves uh, learning capability. You know, uh, yeah, improves learning, I guess, for children, and you know, it allows them maybe to be role models and mentors for others who may, you know, be kind of on the border of, you know, not sure, you know, what life's all about. But, you know, so one of the things that uh, you know, I hear sometimes in some of the communities is that lack of, uh, you know, uh, whether it's gymnasiums or places where children can gather and uh, sports and that type of thing. So when we're looking at, uh, you know, major, major projects like this, do we somehow look at ensuring that gymnasiums are included or would be included? Because it does impact health, it does impact learning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister Vicini. Thank you. So under the previous capital standards, gyms were included uh, once a school hits a certain number of, of students. Uh, if the school did not have that uh, base number of, or that number of students, then there would be no gym. And the gym that um, the school would get once they, they hit that number of students was, was small and then it would gradually get bigger as the population got bigger. What we've done with the new capital standards is included gyms in all schools and increased the sizes uh, according to the, the enrollment. So I know there are some schools with very, very small gyms and we won't be seeing those anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no further questions. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while we're talking about capital, sorry, capital standards and accessibility, uh, tomorrow night is the grand opening of a new school in Yellowknife, Eclo School, and they did a beautiful job on uh, incorporating gender-neutral washrooms in the school. And so I'm wondering if that is a component of capital standards going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Member Minister Vicini. Yes, that is covered in the new capital standards as well as uh, when we do retrofits. Uh, so when we go and uh, say a bathroom is in need of repair and, and we repair it, uh, we also use that lens as well. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Cam Lake. 
Excellent. Thank you very much for, for that, Madam Chair. I think that's uh, very important, and I'm happy to hear that the department has incorporated that. My next question is in regards to Mangal Islick, uh School, which is uh, a major project up in the Beaufort Delta, and it says that the estimated completion date is 23-24. Uh, and so is it September of 2024 that we will, uh, that it is anticipated that students will first start school uh, in that new school? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Minister Vicini. Yes, thank you. Thank you, member for Cam Lake. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, so I, that's good to hear, and I know that um, I've heard from people in Tuktoyaktuk -tuk that are, are very excited for, for that opening, as I know that my colleague from Nunakput is, is as well. Um, <clears throat> given that that project was originally uh, awarded long before the pandemic and long before inflation and the rest of it, um, has there been significant budgetary changes to that project? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister Vicini. I'd like to hand that to the Assistant Deputy Minister, Mr. Shannon. Thank you. Thank you. ADM Shannon. Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there was some at the before groundbreaking and the awarding of the initial construction contract, there were some scope reductions that were taking place to ensure that the project was brought within budget. Um, as the project has moved along, there have also been a couple of other revisions, um, kind of really derived from um, the pandemic and global supply chain management. So for instance, um, one of them was the steel for trusses in the gym. Um, we were unable to procure um, the steel in time and it would have provided a 10 month delay to the project um, by the contractor going back and working with the design team a new um, replacement was come up with or a new design was come up with using wood trusses which reduced that delay by five months so we've seen little things like that um, some adjustments as we move along um, but the majority of the contracts and things were in place prior to um, seeing the extreme shocks resulting from the pandemic thank you madam chair thank you member for cam lake Thank you very much, Madam Chair. So just so that I understand, so there was scope reductions and revisions to the design made in order to keep it on budget, or has there been a budgetary change to this project? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Vicini. Thank you. There has been no change to the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I'm wondering, within scope reductions, is there anything um, in addition to things like changes from uh, steel to wood for trusses, was there actual changes or loss to the community of what they will be receiving within the envelope of that school? Thank you. Thank you, Minister Vicini. Thank you. Um, perhaps for some detail on that, I can hand it to Mr. Shannon. ADM Shannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. So some of the types of things that were adjusted as part of the initial rescoping during the tendering process were things like door canopies, um, an outdoor fire pit, uh, uh, some changes to the parking lot design, um, some exterior railings, things like that. Um, a stage curtain was removed, uh, some roof lanterns, um, some metal cladding, uh, things of this nature really. So, Things that are cosmetic, but not primary to the delivery of the education program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to, to the EC staff and minister for that. Um, as far as Chief Br Jimmy Bruno School and Coville Lake School, which are both in planning phases, when can we expect to see the transition from planning phase to building phase within the capital acquisition plan? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Isini. Thank you. So we're approaching these projects in a much different way than has been done traditionally. Um, and we're not even approaching them each the same. They're each different in their own ways. And that uh, answer really depends upon our, our partners. So the Tlicho government and um, the band in, in Colville Lake. So I don't have an answer. We are, we are trying this new way of doing things and it's going to take longer than uh, it normally would, and it normally takes quite a while to, to get a school off the ground and built and opened. So, I, I'm, unfortunately, I don't have a solid date. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further? Oh, member for Monfui. Yes. Uh, Caitlin just asked too. So, well, it is good that, you know, CJBA's working group and technical working group is created that consists of ECE, infrastructure, and the uh, Klitsch government and the uh, TCSA. So I was going to ask about the completion date, when, you know, 
within, you know, when is it going to be completed, this planning stage, like within this, because it's, it's noted in the book that 23, 24, but I just want to know when. And I think you said that you're working with a partner in, on this as well. So, but there, you, there's no timelines, huh? Do you have a timeline of when this planning stage will be completed and then move on to the next stage? Thank you, Minister Vicini. Thank you. So r right now it's, it's 23, 24 is the estimated completion, but I, I would not, um, I wouldn't place bets on that. I think it's, it's a very fluid situation. And like I said, it's new to everyone, us as well as, in this case, the Tlicho government. Uh, so we are taking the time we need to, to do it right. So I don't have a, a solid answer. Thank you. For Montfui. Although, uh, well, it is disappointing, you know, that 40 million is being removed from the, you know, removed from the capital budget. It would have been nice if that 40 million was left alone and, you know, look at it as a, as a down payment, you know, lift it as a down payment. To, for replacement costs, for replacement then, rather than the retrofit. Uh, it would have been nice just left it alone and because there's no guarantee that, you know, we will be building the school anytime soon. It's going to, you know, the planning stage can take five years or, you know, we don't know, you don't know the timelines too as well. So, um, yeah, it would have been nice because the school is very important for our cultural youth and like we've said, before I said it, and Klitschko government has said it before, the school is 50 years old, it is old, and it was built by the federal government of the day without consulting the people. And for 50 years, the young people have been trans, you know, like have been going from Bechakon to Edzo school, and it takes at least roughly about an hour to get from, from Bechakon. You know, the return trip is like roughly about an hour, you know, to be on the road, on, especially on the main highway coming from the junction to Edzo, it's Highway 3, part of Highway 3, and it's the main route. It's a very busy route. So, and the attendance, so what we've seen in the past too is that when the student miss a bus, what they've done in the past is that they go, they hitchhike on the highway from Bechako, you know, and, uh, and when the school was going through the retrofit, same thing, students were hitchhiking from Edzo to Bechako as well. You know, and it goes both ways. So, it's it's really a disadvantage for our for our young people. So that's why the school is very important for for our youth, Klitschko youth, and that's why I really support the Klitschko government on building a new school in our community in Bechako. It's not just that one alone too. There's a Wati school as well. But I see that there's a little project in our in um, it was in here. Um, so, but, uh, but that one, I will, you know, um, talk to you more about it after. So, uh, but the, it's just a CJBS $40 million is a lot of money and it would be nice just to lift it in there as a, you know, as a down payment. Thank you, member, Minister Vicini. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And so of course we can't speak to any, any particular numbers, um, but I, I'm not sure who we would make a down payment to. We don't even have land identified for a school yet, so we're, we're a ways off. But uh, I wish the federal government would have built the, the school in, in Betrico as well. It would have, uh, would have made this process a lot easier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. Member for Montfui. Well, the infrastructure um, said it before when they, um, they successfully found money to build, you know, um, to complete to build the Frank Channel Bridge because they were short and they successfully found the money. So the 40 million would have been like if it was left alone as a down payment, then they could have um, um, lobbied the government to get extra money because I know that school is not, it's, it's, it's gonna be more than 40 million to build. And, and from what I heard from some of the leaders, it's that it's like a super school that we're talking about. So, um, yeah, it would have been nice. So if they lifted at that and we could have built on it, and then it just at um, uh, Klitschko or Bichoko is the only one of all the school in the Northwest Territories. Bichoko is the only one that was told, or Klitschko government were told, to go find your own money to find the money to build the school yourself, you know? I mean, that's the, that's the message that we basically heard, is that 
go find the extra money. So, but it is okay though that, you know, I mean, they're doing that planning stage. They're doing, uh, they, they created the, um, the working group and a technical working group, so which was greatly needed, but it just that it moved from that capital, from the capital project to the planning. So we're going back again, but if it was left, that 40 million was left, it would have been good for us to build on it. So now I'm just wondering, so, so if the, because the school is 50 years old, you know, like it's old. So if any of the infrastructure fell, so is the minister prepared to deal with all these, these 500 students? Because if anything happened to the school, so where are we going to uh, school these young people? Like there's about 500 students that are registered in, in Chief Jimmy Bruno's school in Edzo. So what are we going to do with them if the, major, if the infrastructure fail? Do, do you have a plan? Does the minister have a plan in place? Like, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, member. Minister Vicini. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the federal government does not fund um, schools. The bridges are, are one thing, schools are another. Uh, there's a division of power in Canada under the Constitution, and the federal government does not want to get into funding schools, which is generally a provincial territorial um, area. And so the, the Tlitro government um, informed us that they would like to take the lead on approaching the federal government to find funding. I never told them to go find it themselves. Um, and in, in terms of what, what would happen if there was a failure at the school, we don't wait until schools are you know, about to collapse um, before we start this process. We start this process well in advance uh, so that we don't run into situations like the, the members talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Mofwe. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, well, like I said, the school is old. Like something's going to fail. If something failed, like do you have money in place like two million that's where the planning stage that's what it was I don't know if it's changed but um so if anything happened to the school like I mean anything can happen you know because it is an old school and it's been there like since 1972 it's 50 years old so and it's been through quite a few retrofit before that I am aware of so if anything happens like you know we don't we don't know, like, so I'm just asking the minister, like, are they prepared? Is there, like, if there was some money left in there for, like, to, to deal with m the major infrastructure failing, would have been nice so that we have a plan in place, we know what to do. If not, is the minister going to, you know, like, uh, transport our students every day from Bichakon to Yellowknife? Like, is Yellowknife willing to take our kids in? Like, I mean, that's like 500 kids that we're talking about, so... That's why I'm just asking that. It would be nice if there was another plan in place, like just in case, because we don't know when this project is going to be completed. The planning stage, or it says estimate, uh, estimated completion date is 23-24, and after that, it's the building stage and all that. So I'm just wondering if there's any plan in place. So it would have been nice if there was some money left in the retrofit budget for our capital budget. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Vicini. Thank you. So the member's raising some very interesting and, and different uh, budgeting uh, proposals, and I think that's more of a conversation to have with the Minister of Finance. Uh, we budget for projects that we intend to complete, um, and I'm, I'm, there, are, there are funds in case of school, if, if there is a boiler that explodes at a school, it's not like there's no money listed in here, that, uh, so that means we'll just never fix it. We deal with issues as they arise. We perform maintenance. The school is old, but there have been uh, retrofits. There's regular maintenance. Uh, so I, I don't want anyone here to, to leave thinking that the school is about to uh, collapse and be uninhabitable. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final... Well, I was going to ask the minister, will the minister commit to building a new CJBS in Bichicum, part of the capital plan, 100% 100 supported by JNWT? <laughs> thank you, member. Minister Vicini. No, thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions, member, for uh, Tabacha? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to... Uh, Acknowledge that uh, you know I'm a, uh, probably one of the biggest supporters of education, 
always was, always will be. Education is extremely important not only to young people, but to everyone, including adults. And um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, first of all, was uh, at the recent uh, Council of Leaders meeting, the Indigenous Leaders Council meeting, one of my friends there that I've sat with for 14 years, and that was the um, chief of uh, Coval Lake. And him and I used to sit around and have chats during those uh, 14 years that I've sat around the table with him. And um, uh, a gym should be compulsory for any small community because not everybody gets to uh, uh, have that and it shouldn't be on how many people you have in, in the school. It's a necessity for mental health, for fitness, for everything else. And he always talked about that. And uh, I would really appreciate if the minister considers some of those things for a small community like that, because it's really important for their well-being. And you know, and um, I respect that uh, chief very, very much because he's a down-to-earth, very honest, and a very sincere leader. Um, and I, so I just, I just felt obligated that I have to speak on his behalf. And the other thing I want to talk about is, if we're talking about ages of schools, I just uh, want to make sure that somewhere in the future, I don't expect it today, uh, because we, there are several buildings that have to be changed in Fort Smith, and we have the two federal day schools still standing. And our, my school, our both schools, are 64 years old and 66 years old, the two oldest schools in the territories. And I'm sure Hay River is not too far behind, okay? Because I remember the, the, you know, in that area of, what, of when the schools were built. So um, I'm not saying today, but I want to make sure that in the future that, uh, that we plan. Uh, we don't expect two schools in one year or anything like that but I want to put uh, the department on notice that those are old schools and they are federal day schools that were connected to the residential schools that were served there. And uh, I appreciate um, that things take time and I know the bu budget process here, uh, but I just want to make sure that it's, it will be on the radar, radar sooner than later. Um, and I don't have any other questions I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I don't expect the minister to answer those questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Tabacha. All right, so if there are no further members to speak to this section, education, culture, and employment, junior kindergarten to grade 12, school services, infrastructure investment, five million, six hundred and twenty-three thousand dollars does committee agree Agreed. committee please turn to page 21 labor development and advanced education with information items on page 22 education culture and employment labor development and advanced education infrastructure investment three million five hundred thousand dollars does committee agree member for yell knife north Thank you, Madam Chair. We don't talk about the Anuva campus much, so I'll ask a question or two. Can, firstly, can the minister remind me how much federal money is in the Western Arctic Research Center warehouse replacement here? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Isini. Thank you. There's uh, money from a number of sources, so I will hand it to Mr. Shannon to discuss that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ADM Shannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the 2.53 million that you'll see under the 2022-2023 capital estimates is federal money that came from CERNAC. Uh, the 3.5 million that you see under 23-24 is a GNWT investment in the project. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess I, I, I believe this building is already under construction as we speak. Uh, can I just, are we on track? When, when do we expect it to be complete? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Isini. Thank you. Um, so the, the work is being done to, um, at the site, but I don't believe the project's been tendered yet. We're expecting it in 20, uh, fiscal year 24-25 to be completed. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Yellowknife North. 
Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess my next question is, you know, we're looking at labor and development advanced education here. There's three and a half million dollars this year for the Newber campus. That's good, but uh, you know, we have released a, f a facilities master plan, or I forget what we called it, for Aurora College, and there's hundreds of millions of dollars of work to be done. Uh, not seeing that here. <laughs> I, I guess, can the minister provide us a bit of an update on when he expects to see some uh, other Aurora College projects go first? I, and I believe uh, first on that list is uh, replacing one of the day schools in Fort Smith. Uh, was, thank you, Mr. J Madam Chair. Thank you, Member uh, Minister Vicini. Thank you. I think the member was referencing the, the residential school residents in, in Fort Smith, not, not a day school. Um, so. We are engaging with the federal government on, to try and, and find some funds to, to make these projects a reality. Uh, I'm heading to Ottawa in a few weeks to have uh, discussions with a number of ministers. Uh, so I, I don't have a, a date uh, yet because we don't have the money yet. Development of these facilities is highly dependent upon uh, federal funding. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Are there any further questions under the Education, Culture and Employment, Labour Development and Advanced Education? Infrastructure Investments, $3,500,000. Does committee agree? Thank you, members. Please return now to the Departmental Summary of Count on page 17. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that this committee defer further consideration of the estimates for the Department of Education, Culture and Employment at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? <laughs> Abstentions? Motion is carried. <laughs> Thank you, committee. Thank you, minister, and thank you to the witnesses. Sergeant at Arm, please, please escort the witnesses from the chamber. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that the chair rise and report pro progress. Thank you. There is a motion on the floor to report progress. The motion is in order and non debatable. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is carried. I will now rise and report progress.
Please have the report of committee the whole member for Nevictoon Lakes. Mr. Speaker, your committee has been considering Bill 53 and table document 723-19 brackets 2 and would like to report progress with one motion passed and that Bill 53, an act to amend the Liquor Act, is ready for third reading. And Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee of the whole be concurred with. Thank you, member for New Twin Lakes. Do we have a seconder? Member for Great Slave. All those in favor? All those opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is carried. Third reading of bills. Third reading of bills. Minister responsible for infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the honorable member for Hay River North that Bill 52, Elevators and Lift Act, be read for the third time. And Mr. Speaker, I request a recorded vote. Queen Aini. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Colleagues, uh, requested vote was requested. Motion is in order and is debatable. Question has been called. As I mentioned, it's a requested vote was re requested. So, all those in favor, please rise. The member for Inuvik Boot Lake, the member for Yellowknife Center, the member for Hay River North, the member for Inuvik Twin Lake, the member for Hay River South, the member for Thabacha. The member for Cam Lake, the member for Yellowknife North, the member for Montpuy, the member for Great Slave, the member for Nahende, the member for Yellowknife South, the member for Satu, the member for Range Lake. There's also the recorded vote, 14 in favor, zero opposed, zero abstentions. The motion is carried. <laughs> Bill 52 has had third reading. <laughs> third reading of bills, third reading of bills. Minister responsible for justice. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the honorable member for Nuvik Boot Lake that Bill 48, Arbitration Act, be read for the third time. And Mr. Speaker, I request, request a recorded vote. Thank you, Minister. Colleagues, the motion is in order and is debatable. Question has been called. A requested vote, or a recorded vote was requested. Uh, all those in favor, please rise. The member for Hay River North, the member for Inuvik Twin Lakes, the member for Hay River South, the member for Thabacha, the member for Cam Lake, the member for Yellowknife North, the member for Molfui, the member for Great Slave, the member for Nahende, the member for Yellowknife South, the member for Satu, the member for Range Lake, the member for Inuvik Boot Lake, and the member for Yellowknife Center. All those opposed, please rise. All those abstaining, please rise. The results of the recorded vote, 14 in favor, zero opposed, zero abstentions. The motion is carried. Bill 48, Arbitration Act has had third reading. <laughs> Third reading the bills. Third reading the bills. Mr. Clerk, orders of the day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Orders of the day for Thursday, October 27th, 2022 at 1.30 p.m. Prayer, minister statements, member statements, returns to oral questions. Recognition of visitors in the gallery, acknowledgments, oral questions, written questions, returns to written questions, replies to the commissioner's address. Petitions. Reports of committees on the review of bills, reports of standing and special committees, tabling of documents, notices of motion, motions. 
notices a motion for first reading of bills. First reading of bills, second reading of bills, Bill 58, Bill 59. Consideration in Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters, Bill 23, Bill 29, Committee Report 34, Table Document 723. Report of Committee of the Whole, third reading of bills, orders of the day. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This House stands adjourned until October 27th, 2022 at 1.30 p.m. sharp. Thank you. <laughs>